You're doing things like this along the way, and I'm going to post them on the website so you can go there and access what you need and um, you know how to do that from scratch. So, that being said, um, welcome to Lexington. None of you have come a long way to that. Charleston is here. Most of Charleston last week, you know, been Charleston. It is was a fun time. It was hot. But it was a fun time. Um, so we still have to come from the upstate, land and doors, all the way down to the counties represented, sponsor. So welcome. And if you, you drove in, and um, I hope that you find today's information to be very useful. Um, if you are next and you came today to tomorrow, I hope that you work. I'm going to uh, have a little session called Ask a Bit, and we're going to use your knowledge base. Uh, because if you are here, that means you, especially as an older coordinator, you have been around and you have got some things that you can share with a brand new person. You've been brand new yourself, and you know what it's like to be in that role. You can probably give some helpful tips to those that are brand new. And if you are brand new, you may have had the Title I project submitted for you from the person who recorded you. That's the case. Yay for you! <laughs> <laughs> Next year will be a right trying to figure out what to go and so do. And you're going to want to go back to the training. So like today and tomorrow, looking at that project and say, okay. What was he or she doing before I started? And to be honest with you, uh, as a program manager, every single year, although I've done it for a good like 15 years, I still have to stop, refresh myself. Our team has a refresher training. We sit and we pull up various projects and we look through where is the stickiest part. I would say school eligibility and allegations to the service schools. Pull it up and really look at it because once you get in from the budget, you're all down in what's allowable versus unallowable. In that, who should be served is the biggest piece of the puzzle. So we're going to talk about that today. We're going to just talk from scratch. Okay, because this is a new board members training. So if you are a vet, bear with us. It will just be a refresher for you. Um, as we do just some brown lane for those that are brown. It's going to take a little while to be comfortable. Know that that is normal. That is typical. We are here to help you. Uh, there's been the stigma at the state department for some time that you can't call it there because it will go against your risk assessment. You can call it there if you need too much tech. Systems. We want you to call. We get paid for you to call. Okay? We are here to support you. We want you to do it right on the front end. Okay? So that the back end folks, the content, like right now, the muscles are there. They don't catch it on the back end. They're trying to catch it on the front end. So that being the case, if you have questions, call. That's what that program manager is there for. So that being the case, I'm going to introduce my team. So I'll start over here on the side. Teresa Gregory, she's been up so you can see her. If you're new, you're probably going to recognize these names. You can just take a couple of them. They look good. You look good too. I walked around the room and said, oh, I'm going to see you on the screen. Um, all right, then we have Sheree Husband. Yes, Sheree does the allocations um, for us. So if you have allocation questions, she's the go to for that. If you need to get into these about $900 shorter than last year, that's correct. <laughs> okay, uh, we don't get calls if you get more. <laughs> <laughs> so if there's an error there, we don't know, right? We don't get called about four, we get called about four. So she does a great job. So she's a program manager as well. So if you, if you have her, make sure you speak to her today. 
I'm proud to have Van on my team and have a lot of years of experience as a federal programs director. And I really use her and her experience in that bus to talk about that. And only you have to need to call her. And uh, she, is, she is great. She's a great resource. So if you have a chance, make sure you speak to her today. Sarah Wagers, Rudy and Tammy. There's a program manager as well. She also runs all of our ARP documentation to let her off. That is a lot of work. All those bands for all the programs that we oversee and cover letters, <coughs> amendments that we have to do. She handles the ARP route. So if you have a question uh, about a band or if you need for it to be re spent, you can contact Sarah Rogers. She also helps with our admin money, and does some budgeting on our side. So, and then Martha Walker, this is Martha, and she's cute. <laughs> I always, I always look forward to see what Martha's going to wear. She's always in some kind of cute little dress. I love it. And I saw that recently, I thought, that's what she needs to wear to be more than that, because that's cute. Martha does a fantastic job. She is tanky. She helps me a lot with tanky stuff. She and Eric Brunson do a lot of my website, uh, developing evaluation tools, sending it out, getting all those results. Um, how many of you received the title for evaluation? So, ready to have to do that yourself? Okay. Yes, we are in the process of developing evaluation models. I feel like most of the districts that evaluate for programs in your districts, the other ones become a little more formal. We're doing some things on our side. Um, for Title IV, we have to publicly report how you're doing with that funding against the logic models that you have created. Are you meeting the goals? How is it going? The U.S. Department of Ed has this whole its own Title IV group. We have to meet with them like almost monthly. Talk about how is that going to go? And so I don't know unless I ask. I, so I thank you for doing that survey. Do I don't have Leslie Blows uh, today. I love Leslie. She is on vacation this week. Yay for her. It's a great week, right? <laughs> um, but she, she, even when she's on vacation, she takes her to me. I'm going to say, Linda, we got it. You good. Uh, there's an automatic response. She is just Johnny on the spot. Very nice. And I love having her uh, as a resource as well. So you're welcome to call her. Um, she'll be back in next week. So if you have Leslie, she'll be back in. And I think I got it all. Let me introduce um, the other folks from the office. Some of them have come. They're the liar. Uh, this is the comm team, so they're they're on the back end. They come in and monitor all that you're doing. There's a lot of conversations going on between my team and this team right now as we are reviewing Title I projects, um, and I like that we're there to work together. So lots of conversations happen. Uh, Amy, right there, Greg, the R. Hall, and Pat Stephen Kelly. He's on Basil Harris's team. He's going to speak to you uh, about comprehensive needs and assessment. So I think I got one. Gail Knight, where's Gail? There she is. Gail set this whole thing up. So thank you, Gail, for all your hard work. Um, I did ask her to hold the signing sheets because you will get renewal credit for attending today and tomorrow. So make sure that you do sign in. I think you should already do so. I got it. Um, the restrooms are to the left and the right. When we get closer to lunchtime, um, I ask the tech girl to look up surrounding restaurants so she can uh, tell you uh, some good places to go. Very close to downtown Lexington, um, main drag of Lexington, and you're also very close to the mall. I'll go up there and not come back. <laughs> because you're pretty close to it, on the back side. 
alcoholics. So we'll uh, we'll take a lunch break after a while and have a little bit of time to explore it. Okay, that being said, we will jump in. If you need to take a restroom break, feel free to do that. We will take two formal breaks today and the lunch break. This is our agenda for the day. I sent this out quite a while back, so you kind of know what to expect. I did have people to say, like, they would come tomorrow instead of today if they're running Title four or grant that we're not covering today. Today is really going to hone in on Title one, the big bigger. Um, and then tomorrow will be some finance talk. We'll do Title two, Title four, and three. Uh, brief will be the last one tomorrow. And uh, so, if you're not a brief recipient or have been in the past, know that that is the last one. We'll be attended for tomorrow. And the NFD and OGIP is running our NFD grant. And so, we are going to have a separate NFD training later on, more of course, the fall, for the NFD coordinators. A training not done by us, and so we don't have full training on NFD. So if you're an NFD recipient, uh, that's not. Marvin Tech, Martha and Eric put us on a barcode for all the materials for today, um, so that that's a us on printing. So you may have printed it, you know, for all the with you. If you did, that's great, but. Is a, a QR code to access everything that we do today. That QR code is not still Okay. Title one background and purpose. So if you are brand new to doing federal programs, I would venture to say that federal programs is not the only task you have. Would I be right in saying that? Some of you are assigned to many roles and tasks and grants. This is just a piece of that, and I understand that. And I understand that being in the district, you probably feel overwhelmed with so much on the plate, trying to get it all done, get it all submitted, get it all the final approval. And so as you begin to work in this role, we're going to notice that Title I is the biggest of everything that we do. Um, if you are a vet, you've been around a while, you know that. Uh, but if you are brand new, you'll begin to see that, like, woo, when I get time one, nothing. Woo! There's this huge sense of relief that comes um, because it is the big, the bigger of all of them that we do. And so it says it is the first title, um, and it is the largest federal aid program. I will say when um, lesser funds came out, <laughs> it challenged that second. We helped do those uh, allocations and it turned came out and I said, wow, that's some funding right there. And I know that it's coming to an end and it is going to cause all of us to have to think about what can we transition into the grants that remain. Because we did have that large sum of money for so long due to COVID. I'm glad that we've done with COVID, but it is going to call more work on us as we begin to think about sustainability. You may already be there, be thinking in that capacity. If you're not, you need to, you need to have those conversations about how we're going to sustain programs. What is Title I for? The purpose is to ensure that all students have a fair, equal, and significant opportunity to obtain a high-quality education and reach, at a minimum, proficiency in challenging state academic achievement standards and assessment. Let a sentence right this path, but every word in that sentence has meaning. I want us all to understand that what a span of influence we have when we touch these children. Because these funds are meant to provide opportunities for every student 
that maybe otherwise they might not have had. So if you are a newborn there, let me say this to you. Every year, you need to look at what the title is funding, and if you are getting a return on the investment. The title and project should not be a repeat. Yes, you can pull it forward. You can copy it forward, but it is meant to really meet the needs of those kids. And it is your responsibility to make sure that it's being utilized correctly. So if you are to talk with the principals, all the stakeholders, and look at the data, and really drill down to make sure that every kid has the opportunity for a fair, equal resource that they need so that they can achieve success. That's why we're getting the budget. So being new, I wanted to tell you guys um, what the expectation really is for this budget. We're still working with three grants. So if anybody would be glad to see the 22 go. Oh, that's the two. <laughs> we will be glad to see that one close out. Um, I would say if it was still going on during COVID, and it, that, that would kind of finalize things. It closes out. So, we have now moved into the 24 grant, which is just submitted. And we are in a new model. You looked at the Tim's homepage, and I'm sending that to my call emails too. That we are reviewing in a certain time frame. And if you submit amendments, we're reviewing in a certain time frame. And we expect you to do your part within certain times and us to do our part within certain times. So the model has become first in, first out. So I will explain. If you turn in Title II, the same thing as you turn in Title I. Well, however it lands is how we're reviewed. So uh, just know that we're in a first in, first out model as a program thing. I'm doing my best to keep up from the director approval level as well, um, but as a program manager, we're trying to get it in as quickly as we can. So lots of reading going on for the Title I grant right now. Um, if you are new, know that August the 15th is a very hot date when you are working on claims and things of that nature. Gaps actually shuts down. And I don't have any we rates accounting. We, we can't do anything about that. So know that that is a hot Topic date, um, final expenditure claims are due to go over the 15th of each year. And so as a new board maker, what, what are my goals? What are the expectations for me? I'm new. I have one. I've never done this before. You know, so and so did it. And they submitted it. And now I'm new. That's the July one. Anybody know that? I'm new to the high one, brand new. Yeah. So, what what are you expected to do as far as being a Title I coordinator? Most of you are probably federal programs directors that have been doing multiple federal grants, but in the role of Title I coordinator, you need to be up to date on the latest in education reform efforts and to understand curriculum and instruction. If you don't do curriculum, in your district, you need to be friends with the person that does because you're going to be helping to fund all that. Okay, y'all need to be in conversation. Same thing with finance. I'd say that can solve the kids getting more and then the folks won't be able to be as friends, okay? Because they are not supposed to submit gas until you do camps. Say that. You're not running the show. You are. You initiate. Okay? They come after you. Okay? So become good friends with finance because on our side, sometimes I'm like, oh, there's gaps. And Jim said, too, yeah. And then I have to wait. 
Make a note not to forget that when I cruise gyms, I have to go back to gaps on my side because we're operating in two very different systems. So know that you go first and finance comes next. You need to understand the law, the regulations, and the guidance surrounding Title I. Um, if you don't have a copy of Edgar, the Purple Bible, they say, of uh, federal programs, make sure that you get that. You need to understand the law and the guidance surrounding these loans that you are working with. Because guess what? You might have a principal that says, I don't want that. We need that activity and you need to be able to say that it's unallowable. You need to be able to say why it's unallowable. You're the gatekeeper, okay? You get to tell the principal what is allowable and what is not. So you need to know the laws and regulations and the guidance. Um, one coordinators have a major responsibility to see that the funds that flow to the districts are used for educational purposes and intended in the law. Anybody in Clemson thing besides me? I don't know what state girl. I know I'm not going to do that. But I am an upstate girl. But we have to look at it in this that kind of orange. Do you have a house on it? Okay. And it is the program manager's responsibility. And my responsibility when we are reviewing that we interpret the law correctly, and that we help you apply it correctly, we we are trying to take care of you. Okay. So if we question something that you do, please know that we're not trying to hold off on your approval. We're here to protect you. I want you to pay the money back. Okay. If you were to get audited by the U.S. Department of Ed or even Come. We want to make sure that on the front end, everything is done smooth. You need to be well versed in the program and compliance. We last survived. <laughs> you will. I promise that you will. If you reach out to the resources that you have available to you, reach out to the law, reach out to the guidance, reach out. People that have done it before can reach out to our team. You will survive and you might become like me. I love it. I thrive. I was doing this in Dillon Ford before I came to the State Department and I was teaching third graders. And I said, Oh Lord, I don't think I like little people like I don't like it. <laughs> I was like, Whoa, maybe I need to go to the middle school. I did, and then I got into Title One. They had to see the brand back then, and all of that compliance and keeping that documentation and doing all the parenting it is, as you can tell, I like to talk. It was right up my hand. And you may find that you love it and that it is your niche. Give yourself time enough to determine if you like it. Okay. Don't be run off the first year or the second year. Give it time. You may find that you really enjoy it. You might be the one in the district that says, if the comm team comes to audit, I want them to come here. Because if I do all that work, I'd like you to come look at it. That's always how I feel. If I'm going to keep it, come look at it. Right? So it might be your niche. Hang in there. Learn the federal programs from multiple perspectives. You will learn what's the difference in Title II and Title IV and III as compared to Title I. You'll learn multiple perspectives about it. You'll learn how to evaluate the program activities. Is it working? Is it not? Um, you, will under, you will learn to understand and control your budgets. I hope you do. <laughs> that is very important that you track how the money is being spent and claimed. Has Rose Elementary already um, done these three activities? Has all the money been claimed from that? Has this one has only $2 left? Do I need to amend that activity? You will start to manage the budgets in each school-wide plan. We'll start thinking about it from the district level. 
And you'll start thinking about not only the 15%, I want you to learn how to do budgets as you go. So know that math is part of it. Okay? Math is part of it. Have outside resources. Train your staff and those with whom you work. If you have Title I facilitators out with your school lives, train them of what they need to do, how they can help you train your principals, how they need to be handled in Title I funds. Be visible. You are the Title I experts. You know, principals, they may be guessing. You are supposed to be the expert, so be visible to them, be available to them to be able to talk through allowability. Seek help from veterans. If you are new and you would like a mentor, we do do that. Okay, if you contact me, I will work uh, to give you a mentor so that you can have a partnership with somebody else in the state whose district is similar to yours, whose work is similar to yours, who has done it for a while, who you can say, I hate to come and stay the part. Can I just ask you this? Unless they are courts, okay? We don't assign mentors unless they are want to be assigned. So if we give you one, they're okay with it, they expect you to call. Okay, so if you're of interest in that, let me know. That's how we seek help from veterans and work with the state department staff. I want one more. Let this be included in the plan. Get ready to go into teams. And you take a look. You're going to see a piece this afternoon you're going to do to me. But you'll see a link that says LEX website. What goes in the district piece of it? What goes out in the school wide? I will tell you that we like to see most of the money push to the schools. That is where the most flexibility can happen. Okay, so don't try to purchase a bunch of technology at the district level. I know it's easier to pay for it that way, but we want to get pushed out to the schools and into their Okay? Even the parenting club, push them out to the school, let them run their parenting pieces. Okay? So you'll see LEA set size and what it needs to go on with that. And in that district piece, you get into school eligibility. Get into the allocations to serve schools. We get into one um, percent needs to be set aside for parent and family engagement. You need to be taking a look at private schools. Are they going to participate? Have you made contact with them? All of these things you kind of have on your district hat about overseeing all of these things. Really don't do anything with the gyms for school wise until you get them in the budget. Best of it is kind of like having the district have. Greg King will be talking about MOE. So if you're brand new, you look down in gyms and you're like, MOE, what is that? <laughs> He's going to talk about that and give you a good explanation of what that is and how it relates to your work. All of these things that go along with the district level set aside. Poverty. Criteria that you're going to be used to select your service level. Um, please try to move to pupils in poverty if you have not already done so. It encompasses everything. So we do have a few that are still trying to move that way, but it is our hope that, that will be the poverty factor that is used across the state. Um, homelessness, there is a reservation. From the district level set aside for homeless children and you. Tomorrow, Bird Wright uh, is going to come in and they are going to talk about this set aside. Martha is going to drill down into this set aside a little bit today. If you are a vet, you're going to require something new and homeless when we do final allocations. Okay? We had an audit already uh, for homelessness, and they have pointed out some things that the district needs to be doing with that funding. And so, 
And the time we had the audit, you all were submitting those projects. And so what I have said to program managers is if you're sending it back for multiple things, you may include it after new board layers. But when we get final allocations, is really going to want to hone in to making sure that we have in that set aside what needs to be there for homeless. It also needs to be separated from foster care. They do not need to be in the same line item and the same activity. Martha's going to get into that some today. So if you are a vet, you want to listen in because we'll expect that from you at time. Okay. Right. Some of the districts um, provide services for preschool students and with um, early childhood programs on the district set aside level. So you may see pre pre K programs as a possibility for your district, the Title I and Title twelve. Okay, the LEA plan must ensure that it will do what? Superintendent and yourself, you need to understand what you are signing off on. Okay, what are we what are we ensuring that we're going to do? We're ensuring that migratory children, former migratory children, are selected to receive Title I services on the same basis as other children. That we provide equitable services to private school children. That we coordinate and integrate Title I services with other educational services such as MLs, children with disability, migratory, homeless, children in need. Designate a point of contact with DSS. Establish procedures for transporting foster care students to the school of origin. Ensure that teachers and paraprofessionals working in Title I programs meet state certification. And licensure requirements. I don't have my notes, but I go past my part on the let me know. Because I'll do all the I'll just keep the train moving. So say something about the next call. All right, the plan developed. Sometimes when we've done these programs for a really long time, when we think about stakeholders, we don't think about it hard. Okay, some of these programs have specific people that are supposed to be serving the stakeholders. So, like if you get to the Title IV project, and I'm jumping into tomorrow, if there you read gems for stakeholders. Certain people are supposed to be at the table. Okay, so you as a new, let me tell you what you're not supposed to do. You are not supposed to decide how these funds are spent right by your state. Okay, let me give a warning. Finance in your district is not supposed to decide right by themselves how these funds are spent. Okay, it is done. The stakeholder engagement and data. You come to the table to talk about the children. What are their needs? Mr. Pat is going to talk about needs assessments. It's a real thing. If I pull up a project and the needs assessment does not match what I'm reading in school I plans, it's coming back. Okay, it's supposed to show us. How these funds are meeting the needs of those children. Okay, so we want to make sure that we develop the plan in consultation with teachers, principals, administrators, and other appropriate school personnel, and with parents of children in school serving under this law. You know, it can be kind of boring. You don't have to think it over. You don't think it's the stakeholders. I didn't say you could feed them, but <laughs> it doesn't have to be bold. Be fun and engage. If they're giving you their time, be serious with it. Ask for their input. Be planned in advance. This is what I need you to tell me about. 
Okay, it's supposed to be a true engagement. Guess what? We have to do the same thing from the state level. So we have a community of practitioners. When I call them together, I don't want to waste their time. I want to say, okay, I need to talk about so and so, and I want to hear your thoughts on so and so. Okay, and we take all that feedback and we apply it. Okay, so make sure that that stakeholder involvement is tight and you keep the documentation so the comm team can see when you met, how often you met, and that they're truly having input into the planning process. There are three major fiscal rules that reinforce the fundamental Title I requirement. And today I will talk about supplement last plan as it relates to Title I only. Greg is going to talk about, excuse me, comparability and maintenance of effort. But all of these serve as like legs to, to the stool that supports Title I. And as a new person, these can kind of feel overwhelming. And it might be that you need to call. And have a look to for after this. We don't expect you to just get all that they want. And we're here to support you. So as we get into these physical requirements, know that Greg is happy to take a phone call from you. Guys and TA, I'm happy to do the same as well as the program managers. When I think about supplement not supplements, just a little blip before we get there. I think about it coming on top of it. So after all, I will talk about that. How are these funds coming on top of what they're already supposed to be? It's just an easy way to think about supplement content. We want to supplement. We don't want to. Stated local funding of Title I schools is at least equivalent to the funding provided to non Title I schools. The definition of comparability and make LOE means maintenance of effort. It means that the state and the district are maintaining the current level of state and local financial support, education, and now I know it's not going to be okay. Just that. We're going to take a formal break after he does the end assessment if you need to step out for the room. Good morning. My name is Pat Sinkinsale, and I work in the state office with all these other folks. I work on innovation and support to gain health. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about this assessment this morning. Um, you know, it's not boring. It's, it's, it's really fundamental to what you do. And uh, as Jennifer talked about that, okay, so you've got this money. We help kids. Let me do that. So what is a needs assessment? A needs assessment really is just Thinking uh, your current reality, comparing it to the vision that you have for your programs. And so your first step in approving it is making sure that you understand that gap. The assessment is a process. She talked about including stakeholders when she was talking about some of the things that we'll do. You wear many hats in your role. Um, and she talked about the fact that you need to get to those folks. This process will be the same way. Because uh, it is a process. It has to include lots of stakeholders. There has to be lots of dialogue and opportunity to share so that you can deeply understand what's going on. And so, a needs assessment is really that systematic examination of the gap between your current reality and where you're going. Uh, unfortunately, many times in the district, you get busy. I get it. This would be my 40 seconds school year coming up this fall. I'm still working in a district. I still work in public education, obviously. Uh, so I spent a lot of time working with everything from being a teacher to a superintendent. And this process is really important. I can't overestimate, I can't overemphasize how important. And so, in fact, before we even talk about this slide, I just want to share a kind of an analogy. Analogies help me to understand. All right, so all of us have um, been to a position of a doctor. You go to a doctor and you're not feeling well, something's going on. You want that doctor to be able to help you. So they're going to be diagnostic at different levels. They may 
look at your throat. They may take your temperature, right? They may look at your pulse or your look your blood oxygen, and they look at your um uh what say it up on your oh my gosh blood pressure. See what happens in two years in your mind. That your blood pressure, and we can get diagnostic as deep as you want to go, right? That's the answer. Um, if that doctor only does a very, very brief look at what you are physically, how's he going to make a plan? Right? It's not, it's not going to be easy. If you're using the needs of that plus for compliance, and you're doing the minimum, and you're not really diagnosing what's going on, you're not serving your children. You're not doing what 10% of Title I, but you're what you're charged to do to provide that fair, equitable, and significant opportunity for kids to work at grade level. So using that medical analogy, we are we had challenges before COVID. What's our data look like now? This is even more challenging. And, and that's that's real. It isn't anybody in this room's fault. It isn't anyone in your district's fault. It's just the way it is. We have kids who are educationally sick. We do at greater numbers than we've ever had. This process has never been more important. It really hasn't because you've got to be diagnostic. You've got to be deeply diagnostic to understand what your challenges are. So when you go to have that conversation, if there's not somebody there that really understands what you're doing, how can you do a positive challenge for reason? I mean, truly positive challenge for reason. That's, that's hard work. I guarantee your training was extensive, right? Can you imagine a district making a plan? And they do all the time without talking to someone like you. Done that. There's no way. There's no way that plan is going to make sense. Math, I can, we could go on, right? Talk about all the little challenges that we have today. Have you seen the math tools? They're, they're really, really bad. The worst work we've had in a long, long time nationally, not just in South Carolina, all over the country. And the challenge is that we've got to make a plan to fix that. The good news is, is that we're going to get federal money. We're going to be compliant at the state level in South Carolina. You have to do a needs assessment. And so that old saying, the key thing we're doing is we're doing well. That's my spiel today, is if you just take that, help be a part in your district of a team that doesn't do this process or comply. If you hear that today, then that's a start. Because we can help you. As Jennifer said, there are folks at the agency on our team, information support, and our contact information is at the end of the slides. Um, we're here to come and help. I've done these assessments on the district side, right? I mean, we were in that, we, we did these things. And so I can help do that. I think our team can as well. But uh, it's there. So the key questions to consider where are we now? Where do we want to be? How will we get there and what are we doing along the way? So this, this is not really a complicated process. What's complicated is how diagnostic you get, right? If you're looking at your ST ready day and you take a general look at it from last year to this year, and you say, okay, that's our data, that's our information, is that diagnostic enough? It's not even close. It will tell you what your temperature is, whether you're not feeling well or you're feeling better. But it won't tell you why. And so that's an example of where you're going to get more diagnostic. So school improvement is not a mission. Like Smoker said, incremental improvement is not only possible, but it's, it's, it's probable under the right conditions. The right conditions include making a point. Another little saying of school improvement is people improvement. If the people who are teaching your young children to read aren't better at doing that because you provided them with the training and the plan to do that, you didn't improve. You can't expect an improvement. If the people who are teaching math at the early and middle school levels aren't good at what they do, you need to include it in your plan. If you don't have the diagnostic information to determine if that's happening, that's the first thing that goes into the plan. We need to add the tests to make sure that we have the MRI so that we can get deep into and understand diagnostically what's happening. Why are SC ready scores not going up? If I look back at the districts, in some cases, their SC ready scores have been flat for years. And every year they do a needs assessment and they plan and they do the thing. 
because they're not getting deep enough to do those. So Mike Schmoker would tell you, I agree with him. That, yeah, under the right conditions, that's the diagnostic, that's the new plan, and that's changing people. This can happen. And so I love this slide because I think it's true. We got an education, I'm sure, for the right reason, and that's because of kids, because of children. The students deserve school to prepare them to be successful. I have grandchildren that are in school. That's important to me. And so this slide for me was just to say to you, remember your walk, right? Why you got into education. So please, again, don't be a part of a group or a team that will say your needs assessment in the process of understanding what you can do to help kids. We got a lot of money that's represented in this room, right? A lot of title money, a lot of federal program money that you can use. How do you use it in a way that's going to make a difference? So again, remember, remember that one. All right, so why conduct a needs assessment? Jennifer mentioned to a comprehensive needs assessment, sometimes they need to use the word a consolidated comprehensive needs assessment. Many federal programs require that you do a needs assessment. At the state level, your district strategic plan and your school removal plans require that you do a needs assessment. So you have to do one. Should you be doing one for all of those? Should you do one big plan? Perfect world, you should do one big plan that will focus on those things that are most important in your district, break those funds, use those funds in a way that will truly make a difference. That's probably above your level, that decision, but you'll hear me at the end. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, an initiative that we have to have a tool to help you do that. It's called SCORE. If you haven't heard of it yet, it's coming. Oh, soon. Or later. Uh, but it's the tool. It's not the philosophy. Philosophy should be there now. But you should be doing a comprehensive needs assessment. And so, because you do have to do one federal programs, you have to do one for state programs. Uh, and it should include the stakeholders, folks, in a comprehensive way that truly get to the challenges you have in your district. So that goal that needs assessment then is to help those educators, that last goal is to identify, understand, and prioritize to improve. One of the other little topics, if you will, so many times the school plans have way too many priorities. It really, it really has to focus. I know because of all the different federal programs and all the different things that you end up having to have quite a few of them just to be compliant, but there are priorities and things you have to focus on. Make sure that that comes through in a comprehensive way so that you can attack it the way it makes sense. So, this is again, it's, it's the needs assessment of that analysis of that gap. So, what are some of the kinds of things you should look at in general? Should be looking at your strengths. What are you doing well? Don't don't forget to make sure that you emphasize that, cover it, and, and do what you need to do to make sure that continues that way. Uh, what, are, what are the measures and problems? What are you using to determine if students are making progress? Is it enough? Is it effective? Is it diagnostic? What are the factors that are to the gap? Now that's that that's that analogy that I use. As you look at those factors, really that, that's where the rubber meets the road. And what, is it, what is it that's causing that? Because that's where your money, your planning, your professional learning will be focused so that you can overcome those challenges, right? You want to make sure that it's strategically being used so that it actually makes a difference. Because what I've seen as an example is that very well have a problem with your master. What do they do? Get a math director, get a math resource. I've seen some who will lift the training if it was one or two hours, one time, and then you totally shift it how we're teaching math. Teachers aren't ready, they don't understand it, there's no continuity. As Jennifer said, it takes three years to be good at being a federal program manager. It takes several years to be good at doing a lot of things, certainly teaching math. I would say the nuance of the curriculum. How it goes, scope, and sequence, right? And so I see districts, they have money, what are we doing? Well, this math curriculum doesn't work. We're going to get a new one. What data do you have that said that the SC Ready scores? Did you attribute it to the curriculum, or is it somewhere in the implementation, the instruction, the right? So, so making sure that you do those things is important. You understand those factors that are here to the gap. Prioritize your needs. 
Yeah. Unfortunately, you're going to have to be a redundant a few times on certain things, and all of them, the other ones are coming as big. A lot about data and information. And then having a variety of stakeholders, having that perspective as comprehensive. Again, I've talked to districts, they've done the school renewal plan, the principal will go to maybe the club first. The elementary level, as an example, again, nobody that enters the village. You understand that almost any, that would be like going to the doctor and having perceptions. They think you're like, kind of right? I mean, it's not, it's not going to work. The person doesn't have the training. They don't have the expertise. Nothing wrong with the receptors or with the principal or whoever. But make sure you have that perspective for the information that you need. All right. So, South Carolina Department of Education has an improvement model. I love that first quarter. You can see under the first step, so this is the whole part. We're getting outside of the needs assessment, but I want you to see it in the perspective of what it's used for. If you diagnose the plan through the SS leadership, the role that you can have, and you all take once again those things that, we, that I've talked about, and you're going to select those interventions, those changes. You're going to do the things that will change people. Right? And I don't mean that in a bad way. I just mean Add to their skill set, help them to be more effective, and it is what they do. Whether they keep creating math or they provide support to social emotional learning, whatever that is. And then through our culture, you're going to have a plan, you're going to implement it, monitor and evaluate, and provide it. So that improvement cycle gives you that opportunity to put in perspective what the needs assessment is going to do. The needs assessment is the first step. I would argue it's the most important step. But if you don't have that plan, doesn't matter. So if I'm going on a trip, I've got my car service, I've got all the things I need to do to be packed. I go on the road and I don't know where I'm going, so I'm just going to drive and see if I get there. Right? That's what we do sometimes. That's why the needs assessment is so important. So that's that first step. Again, I love the word diagnosis. That's the difference between this needs assessment that's worth doing and one we did with clients. So steps to a successful process. Those are the things I just kind of reiterated the idea of that traffic of a South Carolina graduate. Remember why we're doing this to help kids help them meet those guidelines that our state has set that are reasonable, help them to be on grade level and meet those standards so they can be successful. We want them to do well. There's a plan, collect and analyze data, interpret information, determine our priorities and connect it to implementation. That's, that's kind of an overview. So, what is the plan? To define the purpose of a needs assessment. And so this is the plan to implement, the plan to make sure we can have a process issue to that, to that process. So if that needs assessment part of it, um, those guiding questions, actions, timelines, responsibilities for activities. So having a plan in your needs assessment is important. And again, I, I could spend weeks on this process. Fortunately, I have a shorter amount of time. But you get the, the idea of what it is, you've got to make sure that your needs assessment is not one or two people sitting in a room saying, okay, what did we do last year? What can we do this year? How much money do we have? Right? What can we afford to do? Uh, you, know, you need to make a plan. Then you have to figure out how you're going to use your money to finance that. So identifying those stakeholders, that's a really important part. As I mentioned, if you look at your data from last year, if you look at your trend, where you're going. Where are you going to need that? You have more social and emotional learning issues. Well, how can, who is it in our district that is an expert? Who, who's the, who can be at the table that can help us and drive the conversation towards diagnostically reviewing what our current reality is for that area within our curriculum and, and where we should go? Is that person at the table? That might change year to year. Next year, it could be something else. It could be a boy. It depends upon what your data says and it's telling you. Make sure those people are there. Articulate the content so the needs assessment will cover how it will be accomplished, what the district will do. Right? So those are some of the fundamentals of when you're planning to develop the needs assessment. I can't emphasize this slide enough. Um, your plan will only be as good as the level of expertise that's there that help you be diagnostic 
and the B, go back to my medical analogy. You may go to your general practitioner, right? He can do or she can do so much. At that point, who are they going to consult? That's not what their data says. They may consult somebody who can do this diagnostic test. At some point, they may get a further um, person of expertise in the medical field, right? And so you get to the right person who can help you with what's your challenge based upon that data. It's the same thing here. You want to have a broad lens if you can. You want people who are going to talk to you in an honest way as well. So if you're a community member or business members, you want folks to say, you know, I'm just going to share with you what I see from my perspective as a challenge within your business or in your school. I think that's always good to hear and help keep yourself and, and that, that process accountable. And so developing that trust in that process too, making sure people are truly being heard and that you're listening and, and open to understanding what challenges you may have. All right, collecting and analyzing data, I kind of talked about it, but again, I can't emphasize it enough. What I want to emphasize so again in front of you is that it's got to be data that's meaningful and done. If your data is your SC rating scores, that's it. And then you're not, you're not, you're not you're going to be able to make a point. You might guess and hit the mark on what your district or your children need. That would be the only way on that. You've got to be more diagnostic. You've got to have data that really helps you understand. You have to have qualitative, quantitative data, and data from lots of different aspects as well. You know, one of the things that a lot of people use is survey data that's used through the report card. I can tell you, one of my pet peeves, so our team reviews the district strategic and scope renewal plan. In some cases, they're local areas to climb. We go from 98% of the parents who are teachers who like the educational setting or what, you know, the different 99% Please don't make people like that. That doesn't impact the case. If you're at not this, because the 98% is because you got the right 40 parents or the right 30 teachers to fill that survey out. I've seen it many times. And, and that, that's not a goal. Don't, don't make goals that, that are not strategic. Look at, look at the data, understand it, and really try to pick it at, at a level that will make a difference for this. All right, so these are some of the areas that you may get data from. So there's we've got lots of data. Um, there's a saying right before you should use this because you have an education. We're data rich and information poor. I, I really like this thing because that's the truth to that. We've got so much data, sometimes we're overwhelmed. What we need to have is just enough information to set priorities and understand where we want to go with that. So, those are just some examples of places that you might identify, gather data, look at, and have those stakeholders in the room that can do, turn that data. It's information that can lead your process. And that's what this slide says is interpreting that. And so that stakeholder process, I can't, I know, again, in many cases, you probably won't be the person who will be defining all stakeholders. But gosh, go back to your different, at least be that voice that can say, do we have the folks here that we need? Do we have somebody who understands social and emotional learning? Do we have early literacy folks? Do we have early math folks? Do we have those people that need to be there so that we can, as stakeholders, understand data, turn it into information, and help it to, to pull our plan. Um, one of the things you want to do, this probably won't be your role, but you know, taking that data and putting it in digestible, understandable formats. That may be a tech person or somebody who really loves spreadsheets or data and helping to see trends and patterns. What's going on? And maybe it's only in a certain demographic, maybe it's in a certain school in your district. There are some things you're different. And you, you need to look at that and, and be investigated. Um, I think that data presentation interpretation should triangulate voices, the forms of data, so that you're looking at it from a perspective rich enough that's information. All right, so once you do that, and again, I, I apologize sometimes this is redundant, but there are some fundamental problems. 
to doing an easy assessment at all. It's not so, the good news is it's not complicated. Bad news is to do it well, you have to do it deep. And this is another part of it. So those priorities you really need to be able to get to a little more than two or three significant priorities. I guess I'm going to tell you my perspective that I've been in the district, early literacy, I don't know. How many people here would say the early literacy program is your result or right when you want them to do something? I mean, guess nobody would say that because for the most part they're not. So 100% of the students that are reading on grade level are right at it. Um, so that's a, that, that's probably going to be in the point. How about pass school? You good? But it's trending in the right way? Probably not. And again, that, that, that's a national problem. That's a challenge. We're not alone in this. Here's the good news. There are people who understand that at a level that if your teachers haven't had that professional learning, um, they can part of your point. I was a superintendent. It's one of the things that we did. We, I could talk for an hour about how much training we did to provide our elementary, intermediate school math teachers. With those tools, that professional learning they needed to be good at what they did. And you know what happened? Our math scores went down. Because when students in eighth or ninth grade, they don't have the foundation of math to make sure you fix that. Really, 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 really hard. It's really, really expensive. I think a lot of time. We used to say, pay me now or pay me later. So one of the things that I always believe in is early intervention. We spent way more money day three than we did in any other time in child life. What does the research say about a student who's below grade level in third, fourth grade? By the time they get to fourth grade, it's really, really, really hard to change that. That train is pretty much off the tracks. So, K through three is your window. And so, the priority early literacy, I can't imagine if that really would happen. What did you want? Today, I can't imagine the student would have probably some social emotional kinds of supports, curricular things, and learning. There's three. Your, your plate's almost full of something. But it's simple priorities for your district. I think that's something that, that's easy to do. That final phase then is connecting to the organization. And so, you know, that's where again those experts are be necessary. You determine the data, determine the gap, you know why it's happening. So our teachers in early elementary just to say are not. Using some of the best practices in literacy. Okay, how are we going to change them? Not by buying them a new curriculum, handing it to them, giving them an hour's worth of training, and saying, okay, we'll get it. how we do it. So we've got to connect that with the station. We've got a professional learning that's timely, ongoing, right? And, and provides changes in how they perform. Um, one of the things. Just a little quick side note that we learned is like with academic coaching. We, we started using academic coaching about 10 years ago at our event, and we found that it wasn't making a difference in the vast majority of teachers. We were doing a kind of um, I do, we do, you do form. That's, that's probably one of the more complex. And we would be in a classroom for a day, maybe a couple days, providing some, some support. So we just said, you know what? We're not going into a classroom with the teacher and wanting to have a two week people. We want two weeks being in there and working with teachers. We found out, still so maybe only half the teacher in our post lab, their pedagogical skills were truly different and, and stayed the same. So we went in for six weeks. Then we went in for six weeks and at the entire grade one because it included BOC. And guess what we found? At about six weeks, an entire grade level where we plan, taught, assessed, and evaluated the information together, that's when the pedagogical practices changed. That's something that we did and just kept experimenting and, and not having the information that we wanted. And you know what? Guided us all, all along now. Damn. Yeah. Us going in and, and, and observing and understanding. So it wasn't just quantitative, it was all and looking at, and, and over time, we finally made a determination of what aspect of coaching for us. We didn't get to the many teachers that we wanted, but guess what? The majority of teachers that we got to pedagogically changed significantly. 
They were different teachers than when we started, and now we are done. For now, maybe we'll circle back someday with all of them. I'm to the part to go out here, but for that part of their journey, we made a difference versus doing a week of three days for I, a week you do kind of a thing, one hit, that changed it. All right, so support for high quality needs assessment. Uh, you know, this is this is at a district level, if you are at a more comprehensive level, setting goals, providing autonomy to school to do what they need to do because every school is different. But you give them the system or the process to do it, hopefully that they'll, they'll be able to do that. Working schools to ensure that their needs assessments are focused on issues of greater importance. So that's a district level of that perspective. Making sure that they set priorities like seen in districts that have 50 schools. It's the same on their school renewal plan. It's the same for every school district. They get that to a degree because then they're supporting that at the district level. But you look at the data, this school needs that, this school needs this, and this school needs something else. So it still should be prioritized and different based upon what their data says. Um, this is the conversations and making sure that there's a nuanced understanding of the school results. Again, that's the interact over the table. Facilitating sharing and presentation at the district level so they can kind of see what does a deep dive topic dot title make sure that they understand. I have a system of communication, um, helping to make sure that your community and those stakeholders that need to be informed know what well, might change. So we get the needs assessment. We're going to do some things here, but we'll take what is our strategic plan? What is our school renewal plan? Make it something that's much better, that's communicated and, and, and not just put on the shelf because now I checked it off on the client. Private professional learning that's ongoing. Again, professional learning has to be timely, has to be ongoing. I wouldn't work personally in a district that didn't do professional learning. It's a little side note for uh, We use professional learning communities where our teachers met during the week. Uh, we had one to two times a week that they met. Or drive, if you will, through our district. We had teams that would meet almost daily, talk about how things were going, what was going well, what wasn't working, how could I do something differently. That ongoing professional learning. What? Who knows better? Who can coach a second grade teacher? I'm just picking on second grade and another second grade teacher. And, and the ones who are really good love to share. Educators usually aren't. Close about helping and giving providing the good stuff, right? Don't share this. Don't work with your products. So, professional learning is important, and then it's ongoing. Um, connecting schools to the available system support. Again, as Jennifer said, same way with our We're here to help you. Yeah. Our set success is predicated on your success. Don't have to pay as long as ours human being, but it's obviously a universal safety. And that's the truth. We're here to support you. We exist so that you can help kids. We do it at a different level. I've done it, like I said, from the classroom all the way up. Right? But, and I love this school. But all of us help you. If you need someone or someone needs some help, you're going to help do that. So here's some examples that the district level, I think you probably wear that hat. So that's the support for the inclusion of a variety of resources. About data again, making sure you're comprehensive. You know, then if we're talking about paying rent and folks, and you're talking to those curriculum folks, just ask them that question. Are these assessments? Let's look at the data that we look at. So, when you guys want to fund this program, what are some of the reasons why you want to fund it? What, what, what was some of the underlying data that helped you make that decision? You don't have to make the decision, you don't have to fully understand it. But you, for your role, you can provide that support by making sure that. They can articulate. And if they can't, be all cautious, right? Be all cautious and say, well, I've been here for five years and this is our third math group. I'm not sure that it, is that really the right step? Should we be doing that again? Not your call, but you're in a position that you're certainly able to at least have that dialogue. Bring your schools together to focus on priorities. So, you know, if you do, Literacy, home day for almost every elementary in your entire district. Why wouldn't you do professional learning that can help all those groups? 
and, and provide that support for them so they're not doing it one off. So this elementary school is bringing this person to talk about it, and they're kind of doing it that way, this person is doing it that way, right? approach. Great opportunities for networking collaboration. If you work in a larger district, there's a lot of really good people there somewhere. Help them, help them attack that nursing problem or that math problem that you're having. Identifying resources and strategies that can be used across and create efficiencies that you can do and provide at the district level as schools can always do. So I mentioned when I first started about score, so the initiative of the idea is that you should have a comprehensive consolidated needs assessment as part of it. You want the money. So it should be that your Title I dollars are being used to support this part of the university. And your Title II dollars are being for, to, to support professional learning for another part of the university. And it, right, they should be coordinated in a perfect world. So that's a philosophy. That's a challenge because of all the programs, all the people, especially in the bigger district. So what the agency is working on through this initiative, which is a support for consolidated operations and resources efficient. The idea being that we're going to consolidate this and help you give you that tool that will make that philosophy easier to manage. And so that's going to be a shift from compliance to really trying to use this process for student growth. The whole reason we're doing needs assessment, the plan that comes from it is to increase student outcome. It's to provide opportunities for children. The universal framework for continued improvement, consolidated needs assessment, and streamlined plan that you can use in order to, to, to remember that improvement cycle that's continuous and ongoing. So, the idea of this initiative is to provide you with the tool. Well, I'm hopeful that if you haven't philosophically started to move in that direction, that you do that. As you move in that direction, some work coming behind that will move philosophically, will be the tool to help support you in that change. So um, here's the uh, innovation support team. If you have access to the slide, you'll, you'll have that information if you want to, to contact us. Feel free to, we'll be happy to provide support um, to you, to your district, in this area for sure. Uh, any questions, comments about uh, these assessments? Thank you. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. 